Welcome to News Click. Today I'm joined by Prabir to discuss the nuclear liability regime in India, in particular in light of the notification on November 11th, 2011 of the Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage Rules 2011. Now the Civil Liability for Nuclear Damage Act itself was passed earlier this year after much debate in Parliament, in particular due to various allegations of India compromising its national interest in order to align with the US. The Act itself lays out the framework to deal with compensation claims in the aftermath of a nuclear incident. And for the purpose, it firstly specifies the various situations where an operator or supplier could be held liable for a nuclear incident. It caps the liability of operators and suppliers both in terms of time and money. And thirdly, it establishes an authority to deal with compensation claims and lays out the procedure for the same. Okay, Prabir, you've already made your reservations on various sections of the Liability Act fairly clear, in particular to do with the capping of limitation and the right to recourse provided to operators. Would you care to elaborate on these provisions of the Act and why you believe these are against the interests of the Indian people? Let's put it this way. It's not that these provisions are against the interests of the Indian people, but the way they are framed, the liability is limited by virtue of the liability of the operator, which has been pegged at Rs. 1500 crores. As you know, the Fukushima disaster, for instance, the damages already is about $1.52 billion. So effectively, the amount of damages given in the Act, which limits the operator's liability, is too small, given the scale of a nuclear accident, the scale of a nuclear accident and the possible damages. So effectively, this is a hidden subsidy being given to nuclear energy. That's really the problem. And of course, unfortunately, the rules have gone even further on this by diluting even the limited liability that has been given in the Act. Now, one of the strongest arguments against the limitation of liability is that this essentially, as you said, means that the state is subsidizing insurance costs for nuclear operators and thereby reducing the cost of business. But given that this is the principle adopted by most developed or nuclear countries, and further given that our country's energy, uh, given our country's energy needs, isn't it appropriate for the government to put such subsidies in place? Shouldn't the government, after all, do all it can to ensure maximum energy is available for the least price? Well. There are three parts to this question. If we really look at one part, does do all countries provide such guarantees on terms of liability? Now, there are two issues in, involved here, over here, which is one is what is the liability of the operator and what's the liability of the supplier? So a lot of the countries seem to exempt the supplier from liability, but the operator's liability varies from country to country. And here, the operator's liability has really been pegged at a very small amount. If we really look at, for instance, Germany or Japan, the amounts of liability there are much higher. In fact, Germany has virtually an unlimited liability and a billion uh, euro uh, in terms of what the insurance has to be for the, uh, or uh, whatever they have to take out in terms of protection, in terms of what the liability is for the operator. So there are different levels of liabilities provided in different countries. We seem to have adopted the worst of both worlds, that we really have given a very slow liability for the operator, now, given the fact that we have had a major disaster, industrial disaster of the Bhopal kind, that this kind of liability limitations really do not, is not in the interest of the people. The second part that comes up is that how to, should we not subsidize nuclear energy? Now the question is, what is the point of giving a subsidy to a particular form of energy over others? Mm -hmm. Now therefore, it's really not one of subsidizing all energy as again subsidizing a particular form of energy and making it more competitive than if you take the natural risks associated with industry. In, interestingly enough, nuclear energy is about the only in hazardous industry which gets this kind of protection. Now it made sense when it was absolutely being introduced first. We didn't know the potential of nuclear energy. It was commercially not clear at this stage. So at that point, to protect, give certain limitations on liability may have made sense. Today, 50 years after nuclear energy has been used, I think this kind of subsidies don't really make any sense. And it does distort, therefore, the priority of which industry should be given how much. I think today, if you want to subsidize it, solar energy or renewables, which should really give the, give, give, be given the subsidy, because they're new sunrise industries, number one. And of course, climate change is a huge issue. Now, given that subordinate legislation must normally be framed within the boundaries set by the parent legislation, why do you believe that the present rules exceed the scope of the Act? Are the rules really not in consonance with the Act? Well, if you look at 
clause 24 or section 24 of the rules, then that really pertains to what is called the section 17 of the act. Mm -hmm. Now there, basically the operator has the right to recourse against the supplier. In case there is an accident, the operator is liable, therefore he can take recourse that the supplier gave him bad equipment, faulty equipment, and recover damages from him. This is really the way the act sets it out. Now there, the act does not limit either in terms of time or in terms of quantum of damages that he has a right of recourse. Now, if the rules, which is really subordinate legislation as you said, takes away certain rights which he has or limits certain rights, I think that's beyond what the the area of subordinate legislation should do. In this case, it limits the time to five years after the license has been given or the amount of warranty, the time for warranty or what is provided in the contract, whichever is higher. The second part is the quantum of liability. There again, the quantum of liability is spelt out or limited again in the rules mm -hmm. against the spirit of the act or whatever actually is a letter of the act. Mm -hmm. So the letter of the act does not give any cap. Here it is capped it to the value of the contract or the damages that have actually be that have actually taken place. And this again is therefore a limitation. Or the damages that have been paid out, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. The, the, the damages which, ha which have occurred or the uh, value of the contract, whichever is lower. Mm -hmm. The third part of it is whatever the damages that the operator has incurred is supposed to be only the amount that is paid out at the time of filing of the claim. But because there is a time limitation already, that means either five years or the value of the other uh, whatever is set out in the contract, there is already a time limitation there. So he has to file his compensation claims or right to recourse claims even before the claims have been settled. Maybe the claims have been settled in a court or has been settled by the claims commissioner. So what he has paid out or what he has to pay out could be quite different. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this third limitation actually makes it virtually a certainty that the supplier will hardly have to pay anything. I do not expect that the settlement will take place within this two years, three years, five years, because anyway, the accident has to first take place. The people have to file claims against the operator. Operator claims have, those claims have to be settled. Mm -hmm. Operators to play out the compensation claims and only then he can file for this amount as a right to recourse. I think in each step of the way, these limit the uh, right to recourse in a very serious sense. And I think this goes far beyond the act that has been passed by the party. So essentially what you're saying is that the right to recourse has been taken away or so limited that it is pointless. And what is going to happen is that Indian taxpayers end up footing the bill for any nuclear damage. This is in fact what the American suppliers have been always asking. That in America, this whole history really started with the insurance company said we can't pay insurance because we can't take out insurance because the insurance payments they might have to pay out in case of an accident is very high. That's when American government stepped in and created the act, the Price-Anderson Act, which actually limited the insurance liabilities effectively. So this is what the Americans wanted from India that no supplies liability and we seem to have not been able to give them to the act itself mm -hmm. but to the rules we have given them this comfort which unfortunately is not within the ambit of the act. Now given the recent debate in the context of safety of nuclear plants with Fukushima, Kurankulam and Jaitapur all in the news recently, do you think that an appropriate balance has been found between the safety and liability aspects of the nuclear regime in order to ensure that our domestic interests are not prejudiced? See, I think there are two issues again here. One is the safety is to be looked after by a regulatory board. Safety standards have to be very strict, even if there is no accident. You have to ensure that accidents don't take place. That's really the purpose of safety and regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, as a, as a measure to see that the suppliers and others, operators, operate the plant safely, the suppliers give good equipment, don't play with the risks of the plant. Therefore, the issue of liability is a standard method by which you ensure that even if there is a weak regulation, that at least we have a right to recourse and catch the supplier and the operator. And that's how the liability regimes have come in all areas. It's not only the nuclear is, a, is in that sense and only one of the areas. So I think these have to be looked at in that light that the regulation really is to ensure that there is the safety of the plants and unfortunately the regulatory structure that is there at, at the moment is really a part of Atomic Energy Commission, 
The new act which has been proposed, the draft bill, also is very weak in this regard. So I think we have a whole bunch of issues which are coming from there. And that's why people really don't trust the Atomic Energy Commission and what the Atomic Energy Commission says about the safety of the plants. And post of Fukushima, obviously, there is much more uh, disquiet on this count. Now, an interesting but separate question uh, raised by the rules is that of the payment of the compensation. Now, the rules themselves require the authority to divide all claimants into different categories based on their social standing, their level of education, financial profile, etc. Now, compensation can then be withheld and paid out by, by the authority to the claimant based on whether or not it is believed by the authority that the compensation will be effectively used by the person. Do you think this is fair and surely there are likely to be practical problems with the implement, implementation of such a provision? I think the whole content of this, the thrust of this is to make a kind of patriarchal uh, form of the, of the of claims commission. And I think that's a very serious problem because I think that we have to trust the people. If they have suffered, they have claims which are uh, they have to be they have, they have to be paid out you cannot decide that the poor do not have certain rights because they are poor and they are illiterate while the people who are more well off can use the money whichever they were i think there's a very very uh, discriminatory attitude which i do not think can be even borne out under law thank you prabir for joining us today and thank you guys for watching hope to see you soon again